All right, let's continue with the intermolecular forces. So the very first one we just learned about was the London dispersion force, and that is all molecules experience. But this next one is only a certain number of molecules. And so the second one is the dipole-dipole forces. So recall that some molecules are polar in and of themselves. So they are partially positive on one end and partially negative on the other. In other words, they have an uneven distribution of charge. So where the dipole-dipole forces and the London dispersion forces are the same is the fact that it's the attraction between the positive on one end of a molecule is attracted to the negative on another end of the molecule, right? That is what an intermolecular force is. The difference, though, is that London dispersion forces were those temporary shifts of electrons. And so when you pull the molecule apart or the atom apart, the electrons go back to being essentially evenly distributed or nonpolar. But with a dipole-dipole force, when you pull the molecule apart, they're still going to have that permanent shift of electrons that we have called a dipole. And so take, for example, the image below. Each molecule that is shown, you can see is aligning itself. Uh, positive is aligning to the negative, right? But if I were to take just one of those molecules and pull it away, it's still going to have that slightly negative on one end and slightly positive on another. And so dipole-dipole forces are stronger because they have permanent shifts of electrons. Now, it's important to point out that, remember, all molecules experience London dispersion forces. So if I was comparing molecule A to molecule B, both of them are going to have London dispersion forces. But maybe molecule B, in addition, has dipole-dipole forces. The fact that it has this additional intermolecular force would make molecule B much stronger and therefore would probably favor a stronger state of matter. Um, higher boiling points, higher melting points, things like that. So let's actually take a look at an example. So let's take a look at the hydrogen chloride molecule and the fluorine molecule, right? Remember, we just said both of these are going to experience London dispersion forces because every single molecule experiences that. But to see if they experience dipole-dipole forces, you have to ask yourself, are either of these molecules polar? The hydrogen chloride molecule is polar because obviously hydrogen is different than chlorine. So there will be an uneven distribution. So hydrogen chloride has dipole-dipole forces. If you take a look at a fluorine molecule, well, it's two fluorines bonded to each other. So obviously the, inner, the electrons are going to be evenly dispersed. So in this molecule, it only has London dispersion forces. So if you think about, okay, well, they both have relatively the same mass, and they both have the same surface area. So how are you going to tell which one would have the higher boiling point? Well, the fact that hydrogen chloride has two intermolecular forces would indicate that it would be predicted to have the higher boiling point because it would be stronger. All right, the last intermolecular force we need to cover is hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding, notice, is a special type of dipole-dipole. So it's just what we just learned on the previous slide. It still applies here, but it's actually a special type. It's so strong that it actually gets its own title. So remember, uh, going back to the last video, that if you were to compare London dispersion, dipole-dipole, and then hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding actually is going to be the strongest, provided that all of the molar masses are relatively similar. Okay, And so how do you know if you have hydrogen bonding? Well, as you probably have guessed, the molecule in question needs to actually contain hydrogen, but the hydrogen needs to be bonded to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. And the reason why is because those three elements are the most electronegative on the periodic table. So what that ends up doing when it's bonded to hydrogen is it creates a very, very, very strong dipole, a very strong separation of charge, which makes it extremely attractive. So some examples of molecules that would experience hydrogen bonding. Water, for example. Now I want to be very clear. Okay, so you have to look at the image carefully. So here is a water molecule. Here is another water molecule, right? The bond, this bond right here, for example, or here, or here, or here, that is not the hydrogen bond. That's actually what's holding the water molecule together. That's the covalent bond. It's the dashed line that represents the intermolecular force in between. That's the hydrogen bond. And notice what it aligns to. 
the hydrogen or slightly positive on one is attractive to the oxygen or slightly negative on the other. So it's that right there, that's your hydrogen bond. Similarly, let's take a look at ammonia. So ammonia, okay, here is, oh, excuse me. Okay, so there is ammonia right there and there and there. So what I did is I highlighted in blue where the ammonia was, but then right there and right there, that's gonna be your hydrogen bond. You can see that it's got those like dots that represent the hydrogen bond. And then pro and finally, obviously you're getting the point here. Here is a hydrogen fluoride, here is a hydrogen fluoride. That's not the uh, hydrogen bond, it's this dashed line in between those two particles. That's what represents the hydrogen bond. Um, let me real quick on this uh, slide here, let me show you. Um, if you were to take a look at CH4, which is methane, would this have hydrogen bonding? It would not, because the hydrogen is not bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Uh, let me take a look at another example. What if we were looking at okay, an ether, which is something like this? All right, we've seen this before. Would this be an example of a molecule that would uh, experience hydrogen bonding? It would not. It does have hydrogen and it does have oxygen, but the hydrogens have to be bonded to the oxygen or, or nitrogen or, or fluorine if that was the case. The fact that oxygen is right here, but the hydrogens are not bonded to that oxygen means that this would not experience uh, hydrogen bonding. It would experience dipole-dipole, by the way, Okay, because this is a polar molecule, right? So you've got this electron density up at the top. This actually is would experience dipole-dipole, but not experience hydrogen bonding. What this shows right here, it just shows, hey, water, hydrogen fluoride, and ammonia, they're relatively light. If you think about their, their uh, masses, the mass of those three compounds are relatively light compared to these other molecules that are listed here. But for whatever reason, the boiling points for them are super high. Why would the boiling points be so high if they are relatively small? And that's because all three of these have hydrogen bonding, as we saw on that previous slide. All right, so example two, we're going to take a look at which of these would be ex expected to exhibit hydrogen bonding. Okay, so if we take a look at this first one, definitely not. Okay, there's no oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen in there. If we take a look at this second one, there is hydrogen and nitrogen. Let's just make sure that the hydrogen is bonded to the nitrogen. So CH3, okay, would look like that. And then next comes the N bonded to H2, so it would look like that. And even though this isn't important, three bonds to nitrogen, that must mean there's a, a lone pair that's there. Like I said, that's not important to answer this question, but I just want it to be uh, consistent or uh, complete with my Lewis dot. But notice, I have the hydrogens are bonded to nitrogen. So yes, this one for sure would have hydrogen bonding. KCl, definitely not. Doesn't even have hydrogen in it, so it can't have hydrogen bonding. In this next one, okay, if you take a look at it structurally, okay, you have CH3 bonded to a CH2, followed by another CH2. And then you have an OH, right? And once again, I should know that there should be two lone pairs here, even though that's not part of the problem. Um, the octet would have to be satisfied. But I notice that I have a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen. So yes, this one can experience hydrogen bonding. Now let's take a look at the last one. The last one is you have your CH3, CH3 bonded to the oxygen and then bonded to another CH3. So this actually is what we saw on the previous screen. It does have oxygen, it does have hydrogens, but they're not bonded to each other. So that one does not experience hydrogen bonding. It does, however, like I said, and I proved it on the previous slide, it does have dipole-dipole. This is a polar molecule. Remember, uh, you may be tempted to think, well, gosh, this molecule right here, it looks, it looks pretty symmetrical, right? Why would that be, why wouldn't it be nonpolar? Remember, because there's these two lone pairs on the oxygen, it actually is a bent structure in all reality. If you were to think about what's the geometry around that oxygen, it's actually bent. And so you would have the oxygen with its two lone pairs pushing down the rest of that molecule. And that does create a dipole. 
But nevertheless, the example two is just asking which ones would have hydrogen bonding. And that would be uh, the second one and the fourth one. Now, if I were to ask you which one of those would experience a higher amount of hydrogen bonding, which one would you say? It would actually be this one right here, the one with the nitrogen. And the reason why is because you have two opportunities for hydrogen bonding versus this one over here only has the one. And so even though nitrogen is less electronegative, it has, because of the two hydrogens, uh, it does have more opportunities for hydrogen bonding. And so it would create a stronger bond. All right, let's do some examples here. So example number three, arrange the following sets of compounds in order of increasing boiling point, which remember is the same as saying increasing intermolecular forces. So if I take a look at, remember, everything's in experience on the dispersion, everything, but we have to decide are there any of the other two that we learned about? So if I take a look at HCl, HCl, okay, remember we saw this on a previous slide, that's a, that's a polar molecule. And so this one, so it has London dispersion. It also has dipole-dipole forces. It doesn't have hydrogen bonding though because there's no nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Water has London dispersion, dipole-dipole forces, and it has hydrogen bonding. And then finally, SiH4, okay, SiH4 looks like this, just so you can get a visual of it, okay? It's just like methane. It's gonna bond very similarly, okay? So it does have London dispersion, but then that's it. It doesn't have hydrogen bonding, and because of its structure, it's not polar. So based on that, I would know SiH4 would have the lowest boiling point because it's the weakest, followed by HCl, and then finally H2O. If I take a look at the second one, okay, you notice the second one, they're all hydrocarbons. That's important to notice. They're all hydrocarbons, which think about what is a hydrocarbon? A hydrocarbon is one where there's only carbon and hydrogen making up the compound. And remember, the carbon-hydrogen bond is nonpolar. So is it possible for a hydrocarbon to ever be polar? No which means all three of these molecules are nonpolar, meaning the only intermolecular force any of these three can have is London dispersion. So how are you gonna figure out which one's the highest boiling point if they're all the same London dispersion? This is where we have to go back to what we learned about uh, figuring out what's the difference between London dispersion. We're gonna look at mass, right? The, more, the heavier the molecule, the stronger the intermolecular force for London dispersion. So actually, it's already set up for me. CH4 would be the lightest, then C2H6, and the heaviest would be C3H8. All right, let's take a look at the third one. So we've got oxygen, nitrogen monoxide, and nitrogen. All have London dispersion. Um, if you think about the oxygen molecule, it's just oxygen bonded to oxygen, and nitrogen molecule is just nitrogen bonded to nitrogen. So those two right there, they only have London dispersion. They're not, they're not uh, polar. And so nitrogen di or nitrogen monoxide on the other hand, that is polar. And so it's going to have dipole dipole. So I already know nitrogen monoxide is going to be the strongest, but then how do you differentiate between which one out of oxygen and nitrogen is going to be the next strongest? Well, remember oxygen is going to be the next strongest because it's heavier followed by nitrogen because it's the lightest. And then finally, let's take a look at this last one. So if we were to look at this last one, I, all of them have London dispersion. We've already figured out that water would be dipole-dipole as well as hydrogen bonding. H2S, notice it looks, H2O and H2S look very similar. So that means that H2S, uh, structurally speaking, whoops, sorry, looks the same as water. Why do I care about that? Because it proves, oh, this H2S is actually polar, so it's dipole-dipole. Iodine is just two iodines bonded together, so that's not polar. So the only uh, intermolecular force is London dispersion. So you would think, actually, that iodine is the weakest, but what's iodine's molar mass? It's approximately 250 grams per mole, whereas water is about 18 and H2S is about 34. So even though iodine uh, is only London dispersion, it's actually the heaviest. So this is an exception. When that happens, the London dispersion forces actually are strong enough to make iodine the strongest, then followed by water, and then followed by hydrogen sulfide. That was an exception, and so whenever that exception happens where it's very heavy, that will trump and 
beat out all those other intermolecular forces. All right, we'll continue on in the next video.